The Destination by Oksana Eliyahu Chapter 2 My Parents Life was good. As an only child, I got a lot of attention from my parents who loved and cared for me. We lived on the first floor in a small but bright two-room apartment with a tiny kitchen. There was a police station right in front of our building, and our home rattled with the noise of passing cars and loud voices of children playing in the small playground nearby. If it weren't for some bushes and trees in front of our windows, it would have been easy to see from the street everything going on inside our apartment. My father was a communist, not because he believed in communist ideology, but because in the 1950s and the 1960s only communist members could have a good position and a decent job to provide for the family. He managed a big bookstore in the center of Leningrad. My dad loved reading and always knew everything about each book and its author. In those days books were in demand. Most people in Russia loved to read and almost every home had a library. My parents had a huge collection of remarkable rare books. For my father, those books were a real treasure, but my mother considered them an unnecessary luxury. This led to frequent arguments. I loved my dad and was very attached to him. His kind round face with big brown eyes and a charming smile looked handsome in spite of his balding gray hair. He loved to spoil me and tried to bring me something every evening. A candy, a little toy, or a new book. I always ran to the door when he came home asking, Daddy, did you bring me anything today? Life in Russia in the 1960s wasn't easy. Even though both of my parents worked, they couldn't get out of debt and often argued about money. I hated those arguments. I wanted to fix this situation. I had a plan in my mind. All I needed to do was to earn a lot of money and give it to them. Then they would never quarrel again. From a young age, I dreamed about the day I would be able to buy a dress for my mom and a suit for my dad. My mother, a very attractive woman with short blonde hair, big blue eyes, and beautiful full lips, loved to wear bright colors and be the center of attention. She worked in a supply department at a small company. I considered my mom to be the most important employee, as her colleagues always needed something from her. She talked on the phone with them day and night. My mom had great communication skills and always supply her company with everything they needed. My parents were totally secular. They didn't keep any Jewish traditions, holidays, or festivals. They both loved parties and often had friends over to our little apartment. The table was full of tasty dishes. Women helped in the kitchen. Men smoked cigarettes and chatted. Everybody dressed up fancy. They proposed toast after toast, always praising my mom's cooking and the Kaminsky's hospitality. I liked it when mom and dad had people over. They seemed happy when they had a party. My father wrote funny poems and read them aloud while everyone laughed and commented. They had a lot of vodka and wine on the table. My mom never drank alcohol, except a little champagne. Dad wasn't a big drinker either, but most of their guests were usually very drunk by the end of the evening. At times they spoke a strange language and laughed. I was curious and always tried to understand what was so funny. Only many years later I realized that they spoke Yiddish, the language of the adult's secrets. My parents weren't faithful to each other. I knew they fooled around with other people, but it seemed to be a normal lifestyle. This is how they lived their whole lives, truly loving each other, but also having a separate life on the side. I did not like that at all but I didn't know that wasn't a usual thing. I thought every family lived this way. Yet in my mind, I was sure that I would be absolutely different when I grew up. Chapter 3 School of Communism I dived into a different new world when I went to school. We grew up learning about evolution and were taught that only people in previous generations were so narrow-minded as to believe in the Bible and in God. In our perfect socialistic system, we had advanced beyond such foolishness. We acknowledged without a shadow of a doubt that we originated from a monkey and not from God. I trusted every word we were taught, namely to admire only the Communist Party and its leaders. 
When I was eight years old, I became an Octoberist. Young Octoberists in the Soviet Union were students of seven to nine years old who were united in a group at Pioneer School squads. The groups were led by counselors from the Pioneers and Komsomol members. In these groups, the children were preparing to join the Union Pioneer Organization, named after Vladimir Lenin, the Marxist revolutionary who led the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. When a child joined the ranks of young Octoberist children, a lapel bridge was issued, a five-pointed ruby star with a portrait of Lenin as a child. The term Octoberists came from the Great October Socialist Revolution. The Octoberists were considered truthful and courageous, hard-working children who liked school and respected the elders. They were seen as clever and skillful in honor of the great Lenin. Every little child in Russia, including me, dreamed of being an Octoberist. In 1971, when I was ten, I became a pioneer. The pioneer organization educated young Leninists in the spirit of communist ideology and loyalty to the Soviet motherland. The Pioneer Organization accepted students from 9 to 14 years old. As a rule, the ceremony of accepting new pioneers took place in a festive atmosphere during the communist holidays at memorable historical and revolutionary sites. For example, in my case, the ceremony took place near a monument to Lenin on April 22nd, which was Lenin's birthday. The purpose of the Pioneer Organization was to recruit young fighters for the cause of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The goal was expressed in the motto of the organization. On the call, Pioneer be ready to fight for the cause of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The answer was, we are always ready. The Communist government's main purpose was to develop a spiritual culture of inflexibility to all that is foreign to the socialist way of life. When I entered into the Pioneer Organization in the Pioneer lineup, like all the others, I proudly tied my red Pioneer tie and was presented with a special Pioneer pin. I gave a solemn promise to the Pioneer, Komsomol, and Communist Organizations of the Soviet Union. Each of us had to memorize and say loudly in front of the parents, the leaders, the teachers, and the students who gathered for this special occasion, this solemn promise to the pioneer Komsomol and communist organizations of the Soviet Union, I joined the ranks of the all-union pioneer organization named after Vladimir Lenin. Before my comrades, I solemnly promise to dearly love my country, live, learn, and fight as bequeathed to the great Lenin, as taught by the Communist Party, and always to comply with the laws of the Soviet Union pioneers. I completely embraced the philosophy, values, teachers, and uniform, and was proud to be a pioneer, to wear the red tie around my neck. I was good at mathematics and enjoyed studying Russian literature. Usually, at the beginning of the semesters, teachers went through the students' list, checking if all the information was correct. When the teacher deliberately inquired, Vita Kaminsky, what is your nationality? I felt so embarrassed to stand up and pronounce in front of everybody that I was a Jew. I wished I'd been like everyone else, a regular Russian girl. If only I could erase this little word Jew from my documents. I lived in a regime where common was good and different was bad. Communism shaped us to think the same, to look the same, and to talk the same. I was ashamed because I was different, but I did not understand my identity. I was always a people person and loved company, playing with many girls after school. We often visited each other and did our homework together. Some of the girls whom I considered my close friends when we argued would say to me, you are a dirty Jew. Go to your Israel. Why do they send me to Israel? My homeland is Russia. I have nothing to do with that Jewish country and their culture. This put a bad taste in my mouth for Israel. I hated to hear about Israel and never wanted to go there. I learned about Israel from the news. There was constant propaganda against it in the media, where Israelis were always shown as an aggressive nation fighting poor and peaceful Arab people. I considered Israel a very underdeveloped and backward place where citizens still rode camels and went barefoot. 
My mom and dad always told me, you need to hang out with Jewish friends, and in the future you should marry only a Jew. I didn't like that my choices were so limited in choosing boyfriends, but deep in my heart I knew my parents were right. Anti-Semitism was in the air. It was harder for a Jew to get a good position at work. There were limits on how many Jews could be accepted by the university. It was hidden, but every Jewish family knew this and tried to educate their children to be the best of the best. In Jewish families, it was a custom to give children extra music education. When I was about nine years old, my father took me to private piano lessons. It seemed to me he was attracted to my music teacher, Lena, a very kind, patient, and good-looking woman. I enjoyed learning to play the piano, but at times struggled with the music notes. Lena often said to my father, Vita is a very good student. She makes great strides. I'm pleased how fast she is learning and progressing. I studied with Lena for only one year and was sad when my dad's schedule had changed and he couldn't take me to the lessons any more. Destination by Oksana Eliyahu.